Okay, let's get into the Word this morning because I believe God uh, is doing and wants to do something in all of our hearts this morning and our lives. If you were part of the encounter on Wednesday evening, we had a great time. Although there was quite a few, there were quite a few technical issues going on, and we had to restart the whole thing. It was a powerful evening, and uh, God is downloading His heart not just for Him and for one another but also for those that don't know him. When we talk about harvest and we talk about what God's been saying as we move towards and move more into what God's saying, it has to look like something and he wants to do that through us with his heart. And so we want to focus this next period of time on the things that Jesus said. And a lot of that is going to be around things he said to do with the kingdom, okay, and understanding that we're part of a kingdom and God wants to extend his kingdom. And Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is not over there or over here. The kingdom of heaven is within you. So God wants his kingdom to be in people. And we're going to look at some of that this morning and God's heart for that through the word. So let's have a look at Matthew chapter five. And we're going to look at verse three for a few moments. And this is in the context of, of what in, in, in our Bibles is often called the Sermon on the Mount uh, and, and on the Mount of Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount. And the first, con- the first verse, if you like, or the first sentence that he went into was this in Matthew 5, verse 3. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Matthew wrote kingdom of heaven because he primarily wrote the gospel of Matthew to Jewish people. Okay, and so um, he, he used the word kingdom of heaven there so that they would receive it more readily than using the word kingdom of God because that would have challenged them and they would have rejected some of it. Well, if he's using that word, we're going to reject that. So the kingdom of heaven uh, and that, that would enable them to at least get more into that and listen and read uh, the gospel. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, what does the word blessed there mean? Because it, it, what it does, it begins to encompass God's heart for people and what he wanted people to come into in terms of relationship with him. The word blessed there means when it, it, we know it means happy, joyful, okay, but it means there's a greater depth than just being happy. And the word blessed there means when God is present and involved in someone's life with his hand, with God's hand at work, directing all his affairs, all that person's affairs for a divine purpose. Okay, so we hear the word blessed there that it says blessed are the poor. So when God is present and involved in someone's life, that God's hand is at work directing their life for a divine purpose purpose. Wow, what does that mean? The word blessed there means when someone's life is in alignment with God, there's a release of God's divine purpose in his heart at work in their life. And also, this is what it means, there's a sense that, okay, this word blessed also encompasses a phrase called Koram Deo, which means before the face of God. Isn't that amazing? That, that Jesus used this word blessed that had a, a much greater meaning than just, than just happy. So when Jesus was teaching the people and he used this word blessed, they understood in that word and in that sentence, not just God wants to make you happy or God wants to make you joyful, okay? They understood that by him saying that, 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 that Jesus was saying, God wants to be present in your life and at work in your life, outworking something divine in you as if you were before the face of God. And he was explaining it, that's the kind of relationship that the Father wants to have with you as an individual, a before his face, a face-to-face relationship where he is at work in us, working out his divine purpose for you and what he wants to do around you. I think that's amazing, just in that little, in that one little word there. And then it says he wants to encompass all of that. He says, blessed are those. He wants all the people that are poor in spirit, those that don't know him, to come into that kind of relationship with him. Isn't that amazing? And, and God came not just to give people information. He came to reveal the Father, to reveal the heart of the Father for people, for you and I and for those that don't know him. 
And in that word poor there, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. The word poor there means to be those who are in abject poverty spiritually, in utter helplessness, in complete destitution spiritually. And, and that's how God sees any person's life that doesn't know him. If someone doesn't know him, God sees them spiritually in abject spiritual poverty utter helplessness and complete destitution. And instead of that, he wants to put, he wants us to have a before the face of God relationship with him, where he is at work, working out his divine purpose in us. Then what does he say in that verse? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And the word kingdom there, okay, we're going to unpack more and more in these coming weeks as to what Jesus taught. Many of his parables are about the kingdom and what that meant. His kingdom is the spiritual realm in which God rules and reigns as king. And this is also important where his will is being fulfilled in that person's life or in that group of people's lives. And therefore, if, he is, if his kingdom, his rule and reign is at work in a person, in a group of people, then it's going to begin to be outworked in the place where they are, the town, the community, the village, the street, the home, the, the city, wherever it is. And so God's kingdom is the spiritual realm in which he rules and reigns and where his, his will, his governance, his rule and reign is being outworked on earth in an individual or in a people and then as a result in a place. So what does all of that mean? What does that one verse mean? It means that God has created us to know him, to be at one with him so that we also then rule and reign with him. So we're part now of a spiritual kingdom called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. But that, that kingdom isn't just an ethereal thing out there somewhere. God puts his kingdom in us so that he can then work his kingdom out through us so that he can rule and reign in us and work his will out in us and through us so that he can then put his kingdom on the inside of others as others respond to him and come into the same kind of relationship that we are so blessed with to have as believers. And therefore his purposes are then worked out on earth. His kingdom is worked out on the terra firma where we live. And, uh, and so that is God's heart to have this quorum, uh, Deo, this face-to-face -face relationship. That's his heart. And so let's have a look in Genesis. We're going to do a kind of um, a, a, a little overview, if you like, of God's heart through the Word. And, and I believe he's going to do something in us in a couple of different ways this morning, which we're going to unpack as we go through the Word. So let's have a look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, uh, 26 onwards. Now, we're going to use some scriptures that some of you are going to be really, are going to be like, you know them really well, okay? And some of you, you might hear some scriptures this morning and think, I never knew the Bible said that or I have never read that before. If you hear some scriptures you know really well, please don't just switch off, okay? Don't just think, oh yeah, you know, I'll, I'll wait till he says something I haven't heard before. God wants to do something in our hearts this morning. So let's go with him. Just invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, work in my heart this morning that I don't just hear your word today, but you do, you change my heart. You release your heart in me in a fresh way today. So let's see what God's heart and purpose is right at the beginning uh, in creation. Verse 26 of Genesis. Then God said, okay, having created uh everything that we see around us, creation coming into place. Then he said on day six, then God said, let's make man in our image, in our likeness. Then he says in verse 27, so God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. So, God's heart was, he created creation. He brought creation into being, if we can put it that way. Then what he wanted to do, and he said about creation, that is good. Now, I don't know about you guys, but um, we've all 
traveled a bit, whether around this country or to other nations, or you've watched TV programs where they're showing you other places you've never been to. And, and when you see some of creation, uh, or you're driving along and you, you, you're driving along through some hills or mountains and you go, you kind of have one view and you look and you go, that is absolutely stunning. And that is beautiful. That's like, and sometimes it takes your breath away and you look and you go, wow. And, and I know often you say, wow, God, you are amazing that you created that. And it's absolutely stunning and beautiful. And, and we, we, we're, we're amazed at some of the places that many of us have never been to. And they look at the world. Isn't it absolutely beautiful and stunning? And God looked at that and said, yeah, that's good. But then when God created mankind, Adam and Eve, and he looked at mankind, what did he say? He said, that is very good. So how does God see people? If we look at creation and say, and, and sometimes our breath is taken away at the stunning scenery that we could have in front of us and we go and we sit back and go, wow. And you just sometimes have no words. You just look at it and you, you're trying to take in the full vista of what you're seeing that you can never seem to capture on your camera or on a video. But when you're there looking at it and, and sometimes you stand there with your friends or your husband or your wife, whoever it is, and you're just like, my word, I could never even have thought of that. And yet God looked at mankind and even more completely captured way than we look at, at what he's created. And he said, wow, that is very good. It was the pinnacle of what he created. And, and what did he say in verse 28? In having set mankind in creation, he said, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, uh, uh, birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So what, what was God's heart right at the beginning? He wanted the whole of creation to be filled with people that were living blessed, that were living in what we've already described in, in what the word blessed means. He wanted the whole of creation to be full of people living in Koram Deo, in, in, a, in a face to face relationship with Him, that every person on the planet lived with Him in that kind of relationship. And uh, uh, that was God's heart. His heart wasn't just to create Adam and Eve to have that kind of relationship. Uh, and then others would sort of, you know, try and have to relate to, to God through him. No, his heart was that every, the whole of creation would be filled with people uh, that were in relationship uh, with him. Now, because God's a God of love, what he did, he gave man free will. And we know this so that love wasn't a robotic relationship, but that man chose to respond to God, chose to live in relationship with Him, chose to live in a relationship of love with Him. And, and we know the story in that sense, the fall of man and the deception of uh, man initially to eat the, to, in terms of what the enemy uh, seduced man into, Adam and Eve into, in terms of eating the fruit from the tree. And, and that one act of independence brought separation between man and God, that one act of independence that the Bible calls sin, uh, separated mankind from God. And, 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 and that broke the heart of God, that suddenly what it created, because it wasn't just mankind that was suddenly separated from God. All of creation was impacted in that moment uh, by what that one act of independence did to separate uh, mankind from God. But yet God's heart, in that moment was not to completely reject Adam and Eve and say, you've blown it and, uh, and everything else. But his heart was then to, to begin to unravel a plan of redemption for mankind. Redemption being restoration to what had been lost. And without going to the details, because there's quite a bit to cover this morning, uh, Mankind obviously began to spread across the earth and many of you know the story of Noah, Noah and the ark and it got to the point where it says the Spirit of God would not contend with man any longer because of the way mankind was living. Totally rejected God, living you know, very anti-God lives and, and God even said that, that he, he 
he was his spirit wouldn't contend and that he, he thought that he wished he'd never created man. And so he was going to wipe mankind off the face of the planet. But yet he found one man, Noah, who was a righteous man. And, and so what God did, and we know in the story, uh, he told Noah to build an ark, put some certain amount of animals on it, took his family on the ark and the rest of mankind and everything else was, was, was wiped off the planet. And, and then Noah came out with his family and from his three sons, basically that's where the nations came from. Okay, so when you read Genesis uh, 10 and 11 and you, what you see there is that from the sons of Noah, all the nations of the world, if you like, began to be developed. And then they got together, wanted to build the Tower of Babel and this, that and the other, and God confused their language and then they were scattered uh, with different languages. Now, God did that because he realised if they carry on, they're just going to end up doing the same thing they were pre-Noah. But yet within God's heart was not, because he promised Noah, he made a covenant with Noah, Okay, that he would never wipe man off the face of the planet. And, and the rainbow in the sky is part of that covenant saying, I'm going to stick to that because my heart is for people and I want to bring that restoration of mankind back to me. Okay, And the word covenant means I will never, ever leave you and I will never, ever forsake you. So God made that covenant to mankind, to the people, to, to nations, okay, at that point. I'm never going to wipe you off the face of the planet again. But God wanted to outwork his redemptive plan and purpose now to bring mankind back to him. And this is where Abraham comes in, in Genesis chapter 12, okay. So this is about God's heart for the nations for people. And so what he did, he said here, in Genesis 12, verse two and three, he got hold of Abraham and he said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God is making covenant with Abraham. So this covenant, I'll never ever leave you, never ever forsake you. God will never ever break covenant. It's impossible because he is a covenant God. So what does he say here? I'm going to make you, Abraham, into a great nation. Now that nation became the nation of Israel and the people of that nation are the Jewish people, okay? So what was God saying? I'm going to make you into a great nation. That nation became the nation of Israel. The people were the Jewish people. And what was God saying? I'm going to, what in, in a nutshell, he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise up a nation, a people who I'm going to reveal myself to them because I want to reveal who I am to them so they can be in relationship with me. I'm going to reveal my heart to them. I'm going to reveal who I am to them so that then they can reveal my heart and who I am then to the nations because my heart is for the nations. My heart is for the people. Even though people have begun to reject God and, and forget Him again and worship all kinds of other things, because He's a covenant God, it's like, no, I'm gonna, I've got a plan of redemption, a plan of restoration, a plan of salvation to bring people back to me, okay? And <clears throat> what did He say? All peoples are going to be blessed through you, okay? So not only the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, God said, we're going to be blessed, but he wanted to bless the nations. And, and when we understand the word blessed, like we've, we've read in Matthew 5, we understand God's heart, okay, that he wants us as people, in nations of people, to live in a face-to-face -face relationship, an intimacy with God, where his will, his lordship, his rule and reign is at work in us. His kingdom is with, within us and his will being worked out in us and through us. That was his heart. And this is what God began to do. This is the big picture of what God was doing at that point. It was, it was all about nations and all about peoples, okay? Then there's some things we could say, if you like, uh, uh, and I'll just briefly say them for a couple of moments. When, when God said that, he wants to bless the nations through that nation, the nation of what became the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. We see that now. There's a, there's a modern restoration 
of Israel since 1948 when Israel became a modern state once again. And that's obviously all in line with the word. And, and, and because why did God reinstate the nation, the physical nation of Israel uh, in our modern times? Is because in his word, which we're going to read in a minute, he, in, in order to reveal himself to them, he's going to bring them back to the land because they've been scattered all around the world. He's going to bring them back to the land to reveal himself to them in the land, okay? And we'll come to some of that in a moment. But modern day wise, Israel is already being a blessing. So there's been a physical restoration of the land itself. And now God wants there to be a spiritual restoration in the land or, you know, of Jewish people coming to know him. Why? Because that's his heart. He's a covenant God. And he said to Abraham, I'm going to raise up a people. I'm going to reveal myself to you and then reveal myself through you to the nations. And, and, and the people of Israel walked with God and they didn't walk with God. They walked with him. They didn't walk with God through the Old Testament. And, and then God promised in Isaiah 53 what he was going to do to make it possible for his kingdom and for salvation to come in us as people. And so this is what he said, okay, in Isaiah, at the end of Isaiah 52, then going in to chapter 53, okay. Now this is God's heart this morning for you and I, for people, for nations. But this is God's heart initially, and we need to understand this, that this is God speaking about salvation for mankind and for the nations. But first, he's talking about salvation for the Jewish people, for the people that he called to be a people that he's going to reveal himself to and then through. So this is what it says in Isaiah 52, verse 13. This, is, he's talking, this, this prophetic word is now about Jesus. See, my servant, okay, this is Jesus, will act wisely. He'll be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. Why did God's spirit not want to contend with man any longer? Because God is holy. What he created was holy. Both creation and mankind. A holy creation, a holy people, a holy mankind, to be in relationship with a holy God. When Adam and Eve sinned, suddenly they were separated because they'd done something un holy. They acted independently from God. There was disobedience there. Something unholy came in and they couldn't be in relationship with God in the same way that they were any longer because suddenly something unholy had taken place. And what the Bible describes in Isaiah 53 is what sin does on the inside of us as people. What does sin look like? Because as people, we see the outside of one another. You know, you can walk down the street and you see people, you know, walking along and we look at the outside. We see the physical form, but we don't necessarily see what do we look like on the inside. And it talks about Jesus here. It says his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. When Jesus hung on the cross, you could not tell who he was. He said he was marred beyond human likeness. He was so disfigured, you couldn't tell who he was as a human being. The beatings, the way he was treated, what had been done to him. And that physical representation on the outside and what Jesus willingly went through shows what we as people are like on the inside before we know Jesus. What we look like, what sin does on the inside. Sin so disfigures us as people, so mars us as people on the inside. 
And, and then Isaiah 53 says this, Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, our sin. He was crushed for our iniquities, all of our wrongdoing, all of our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. So the punishment that was put upon him, all the from, from the beatings, the whipping, the nails in the hand, hanging on the cross and everything he went through, the punishment that he went through brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. Now that, that word wounds there, it means spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally. It means by his wounds, we are healed. The wounds that he went through, everything that he went through, it, it doesn't just represent physical healing because that, that one line is in, the, is in the context of what God is doing to in order us to be forgiven. To, to be set free from sin, the guilt, the pain, the shame and everything that goes with it. See, this is God's heart for you and I, for people. And then it says here, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. Now we need to understand first of all, that that was first, primarily and first of all written for the Jewish people. God's heart wanting salvation to come to those he had called and chosen to be his people, to reveal himself to, so that he could then reveal himself through them. But yet we know it's also for the nations because of what God promised in, Abraham, in Genesis 12 to Abraham, that he was going to raise a nation through him, but then also be a blessing to the nations because God in his heart knew that salvation was going to come through them, through the Jewish people, to the nations because that was God's heart and God's purpose. Then look, what does it say in Ezekiel 36? Because we need to move on. 24 to 28. It says here, again, Ezekiel prophesying, for I will take you out of the nations. This is to the Jewish people scattered in the nations. Uh, I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Sounds like the cross, eh? Sounds like the gospel that we, we know. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And then it says, then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. Ezekiel was around, there was about 130, 140 years, something like between uh, this Ezekiel 36 and what we've just read in terms of Isaiah 52 and 53, around about that kind of period of time. And so God speaks to Ezekiel, prophesies through him, connected with what was already spoken through Isaiah in terms of the Saviour that was going to come. This is what he's going to go through so that you can be forgiven, so that you can be healed, so that you can be saved 
so that you can be restored, so that you can be redeemed, so that you can come back into my divine purposes that I have for you. And, and he reiterates that in how he's going to do that in Ezekiel 36. It's a picture of the cross and, 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 and what Jesus was, uh, what God was going to accomplish through that in terms of ripping out this old stony heart and putting a heart of flesh in and putting his spirit in them so that they could live in this blessed relationship, this face-to-face, -face, this Koram Deo relationship with God. And the last verse in there, 28, says, then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I'll be your God. That's covenant right there. You will be my people and I'll be your God. Again, primarily to the Jewish people. Then that salvation would go to the nations. This is God's heart, God's heart, God's heart. See, this is God's heart plan. Uh, uh, his kingdom purpose is being outworked. His plan of salvation through the generations, right from gen uh, Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, right through to now. This is God's heart for people, for the nations. Then in, we come into Luke. What did Jesus say? Because the, the title is Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost in Luke 19, 9 and 10. But the context is really important. The context of him saying that was this. He'd come into uh, a town where Zacchaeus, tax collector, climbed a tree to see Jesus because he was a short guy, not Jesus, Zacchaeus, was a short guy and he couldn't see Jesus. Jesus came up to him, called him by name, said, I want to come to your house for dinner today. Went to his house and, it, and, and because of what he spoke about and what took place in verse 9, Jesus said to Zacchaeus in his home, he said, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. We need to understand the primary context of this and what Jesus said was to the Jewish people. So he said this today and, and he's come to your house. You too are a son of Abraham. Why was that so important? Because Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a Jewish guy, but he was a tax collector. He would have taken more from the people, stolen from them, taxed them more. And the people hated tax collectors. They despised tax collectors. And what Jesus came and said, he said, hey, to those that are the most hated and those that are most despised, the kingdom is for you. I'm bringing my salvation to you. And today, salvation. Salvation has come to someone that many of you, he was talking to the crowd, that many of you are saying that he's rejected. God would never accept him. We hate him. He's despised. Look what he's done. But there was such a change in Zacchaeus that he said, I'll, I'll give back four times over what I've taken to people, what I've stolen from people or taxed them or whatever he's done. Such was a change of a heart. Then Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. What was Jesus doing? He was coming primarily to the Jewish people as a Jewish Messiah to reveal himself to them, to say, I've come to bring salvation. I've come to fulfill Genesis 12. I've come to fulfill Isaiah 52 and 53. I've come to fulfill Ezekiel 36. There's loads of other scriptures and prof uh, prophetic words in the, in the Old Testament that you come to fulfill, linking with this, but we haven't got time to cover all of them. But he's saying, I am here to fulfill all of those things, to bring Bring salvation to you as a people because you're called by name. I've made covenant with you and I'm a covenant God and I've come to bring you in to my divine purposes so that not only for your salvation, but also for the salvation of nations, for the salvation of people that I so dearly love. This is God's heart. See, what is God doing all of the time, whether it's back in Genesis, through Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, whether it is through, into, through the Old Testament, into the New, through the Gospels, through Acts, through the letters to the churches, right through to Revelation. What is God doing? His whole thing, all the time. He's working out His kingdom purposes on earth in order for those kingdom purposes to be fulfilled, he's bringing us as people, mankind, whether Jew or Gentile, into relationship through him, through salvation on the cross, 
so that He can put His kingdom on the inside of us, so that we can be part of fulfilling His kingdom purposes on earth. And so what does it mean for us as believers to be the body of Christ, to be the people of God on earth? It's to constantly be taking His kingdom purposes to others, His salvation to others. God, in, God never intended the people of Israel, the Jewish people, just to have relationship with Him and to enjoy Him and just say, well, that's great, everything's been fulfilled. He said, no, I'm revealing myself to you to reveal myself through you. So Jesus came as a Jew and, and to reveal Himself to the Jews first so that then the gospel could come to the rest of the nations. What does it say in Romans 1.16? This is Paul at the beginning of Romans. Romans is such an important book in the Bible uh, and maybe we'll cover that over a period of a few weeks at some point soon. But Romans 1.16, this is Paul the Apostle saying, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let, let's just cover this. He's writing to the Romans, okay, because the, the Roman Empire was the epicenter of, of everything then. It ruled everywhere at the time. And if you were a Roman, uh, you, you would say, we're in charge, we're the big guys. And, and the early church was, was growing in Rome because of what happened with the early church uh, in, in Jerusalem, being full of Jews, Jews being saved. And uh, the gospel then, they were then taking the gospel to other nations. They were going through the Roman Empire, causing all kinds of trouble with this gospel of the kingdom going out. People getting saved, people getting healed, the lives being transformed. In Rome, what started to happen? Some of the Rome believers in Rome started saying, well, because they, they still had a Rome mindset of, of we're in charge, everything has to fit in with them. They still hadn't been totally transformed by the renewing of their minds as Roman believers. So even the Jewish believers that were there taking the gospel to the Gentiles there, the, the church in Rome began to think, well, hang on a minute, we don't want to have this Jewish influence. We, we don't want to have some of this stuff going on. So they began to kind of say, well, we're better than the Jews. And, and, and because we're Romans, we're this, that and the other. And Paul was addressing that in the book of Romans. In the first eight chapters, he was speaking to them and giving them full understanding of the salvation that God had accomplished uh, for mankind. And he clearly explains how the, the gospel came to the Jews and, and first, and then as a result to the Gentiles. He explains the gospel in the first eight chapters. Then in chapters 9, 10 and 11, he then explains how God has not rejected the Jewish people in any way whatsoever. And, and, the, and salvation was still for them and still explaining that as the Jewish people get born again and saved, that will become an even bigger blessing to the world. So he was recorrecting some thinkings. Then going to chapter 12 of, of, of Romans, he says um, uh, about them that needing the transforming by the renewing of their minds. OK, and, and why did he say that? Therefore, what went before? Because he basically was saying, hey, guys. You need to have right thinking here. You need to understand that the gospel is for the Jews first, then for the Gentile. And this is what Paul is saying in Romans 1 verse 16, right at the beginning of that gospel that he then unpacks for the rest of the book of Romans. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So God's heart, is one of redemption, restoration, salvation, bringing nations, people back into relationship with Him. But He had a plan that He is still out working. But His plan is not just a plan. It's His heart being outworked from one generation to the next. And we are in that plan at this point in 2021. And God wants to release His heart in us as a church increasingly over these next few weeks. I, I believe this is what God wants to do in these coming months in us, is to do something so deep in every one of our hearts and lives to do with people that don't know Him, the lost. If Let's use the word harvest. And, and the scale of what he wants to do. I believe God wants to break our hearts for that which his heart is aching for 
to come to know him. And that includes Jewish people as well as Gentiles. And in Ephesians 2, it describes, we haven't got time today, about the one new man in Christ. And what that means is Jew and Gentile being together as the body of Christ. That's partly why we pray for Israel and for the Jewish people. That's why we have a heart for Israel and the Jewish people. Because the gospel came to them first. And then it came through them to the nations. And God has not rejected them. He still wants them. He wants to bring them back. There are 20, 25,000 Messianic believers, Jewish believers in Israel. There are other Jewish believers around the world. But, but God wants to bring the millions of Jews that don't yet uh, in Israel, back to Israel, because that's where he's going to reveal himself to them. Why do we pray for the Jewish people to return to Israel? Why do we pray for them to be born again in the land? Why? Because what you sow is what you reap. And if we're praying for their life, for them to come back from the dead, it then the Bible says when they come back from the dead, you know, what blessing will that mean then to the nations? And so we want to pray for their salvation, for their blessing, for them to come alive in God, because then boom, what's going to happen? And as we sow, we're going to reap. And as we, and as we do that, when we pray, God downloads His heart in us for the Jews, for Gentiles, for the nations, because that is what motivates God's heart. And what does all of this do? It's all to bring glory to the Father. It's all to bring glory to who He is, so that He gets the glory, so that as individuals we glorify Him, so that as nations we glorify Him. Let's pray, shall we? Father, only you can work your heart in us. Holy Spirit, we invite you right now. Please, please continue to work in me, continue to work in my own heart working all of us as a church. I want to encourage you to pray and just ask the Lord to break, soften your heart and to deal with any hardness there may be, whether it's towards Jewish people or towards Gentiles, those that are not Jews, just you know, other people just towards those that don't know Jesus. Father, soften my heart. Would you break my heart for what your heart is broken for, what your heart is aching for? Holy Spirit, we need you as a church to do something in us, to do with the lost, to do with those that don't know God. We need you, Holy Spirit, to do something in us. Would you work in every one of our hearts and lives? Maybe you need to say, God, forgive me for preferences. Forgive me for being comfortable. Forgive me for ignoring times we said pray for them or go to them or do this. Forgive me. Don't give yourself a hard time. The enemy will just shut the enemy up. Condemnations from the enemy. We silence that right now. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But there is conviction by the Holy Spirit and that's what we need in our hearts and lives as a church. We need a deep conviction of God's heart to do with those that don't know Jesus. And that conviction never condemns. That conviction releases something in us. It releases a cry that says, God, do that in me. Do that in me. Do it. Break me out of my comfortableness. Break me out of my preferences. God, forgive me where I've got a hard heart or I've resisted you or I've made excuses. Father, forgive me for, for anything that's got in the way of, of your heart being released. Forgive me if I've become so self-centered in my Christianity. I just want this or that or the other and my prayers are more around me than they are about you and what you want to do. Father, correct some things, readjust, change some things in my heart as I, as I just bring this cry to you this morning.
And Father, I ask in us as a church, in every congregation, in the wider aspect of who are kingdom faith, that you would, you would do such a hard work in these next weeks and few months that as in-person Sundays start up, that we won't become focused, we, we, we won't go to church. We won't just come back to church. Father, I thank you that these coming weeks, not just in our own church, but in churches all over the place, everywhere, that where Sundays are, are coming back and, and, and getting going again and all that sort of stuff. Father, I thank you that you're not talking about going back to church, going back to church. You're saying, no, now's the time to go to the nation, to go to your community, to go to your neighbour. And Father, I thank you that as we gather, we're, it's going to be so great, so good to be together, to fellowship in the, when we can do and, and actually hang out, uh, but, but to worship together, to be together in that context. Father, we thank you for what that means for us as a, as, as a body, as Christians. But I thank you that part of what you want to do is that we encourage each other, inspire one another, motivate one another to go, to reach out, and so, Father, I thank you in these coming weeks. You work in us by your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. If you don't know Jesus this morning, you've been connecting in maybe for the first time and you've picked up something, hopefully, of God's heart as I've been speaking and sharing. Only God can reveal himself to you. I can talk about him, but only God shows you who he is. And I, I just pray that this morning God has done something in your heart heart in your life this morning and if you don't know Jesus and you're like man oh, I, I'd love to give my life to you I want to respond to him I want to know this God who I've never even thought about God having a face to face I don't even know what it means <laughs> that's all right but at this moment there's something in you that's saying I've got to give my life to Jesus then you can surrender everything to him right now just say God I'm here I don't know everything and I don't understand everything that this guy's been talking about this morning but what I do know in here, something's happening where I've like, I've, I've just got to know God. And so God, I ask you to forgive me for every sin that I've done that separated from, from me from you. Give me a clean heart and a clean life. God, I give you myself. I give you everything that I am. And God, would you give me everything of who you are? I want your kingdom to come into me. I don't fully understand that, but I want your kingdom to come in me. And I want to know you and walk with you for the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just pray for anybody responding like that this morning, that you would just come into them by the power of your Holy Spirit and work and move. Father, I thank you for just healing people physically, mentally, emotionally, just doing stuff in our hearts and lives at this moment. And so, Father, I speak your blessing, your goodness and your abundance over every one of us and everything you're going to be doing in these coming days and weeks in our hearts and lives. We thank you in your mighty, awesome name. Amen. Amen. I know time's gone. We've gone over a bit. Uh, well, I just want you to watch this short little video from Pastor Andy Elms about the Soul Winner uh, boot camp that we're, we're connecting into during May. And then Rohan's going to come up and just give you some details how you can register for that and, and continue what God wants to do in us as a church during May to do with soul winning and being trained for that. So bless you guys. Have an amazing day and a fantastic week.